This is Adam Zagajewski's poem, translated from the Polish by Clara Kavanaugh, titled, Try to Praise the Mutilated World. Try to praise the mutilated world. Remember June's long days and wild strawberries, drops of rosé wine, the nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watched the stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees going nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You, you should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtains fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music flared. You gathered acorns in the park in autumn and leaves eddied over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world. And the gray feather, a thrush lost. And the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. I'm told that Adam Zagajewski is the greatest Polish poet alive today. He came to American attention when the New Yorker magazine silently featured this poem in their first issue to be published after the attacks of September 11th, 2001. Waking up the day after the election, more than a few of you told me that you were reminded of how devastated you felt after 9-11. The election, I believe, was a real catastrophe. Things were bad enough before the election. Things are more evidently mutilated now. And who knows, but we can be pretty sure things will get worse. Nevertheless, the poet says we must accept our world as it is with grace. I'll say some more about accepting the election, but first let's stick with the poem. The poem juxtaposes the disfigurement and the simple joys of life. The poet says that one must learn to accept or praise the faults of the world if we are to see the beauty and help heal the mutilated world. When things get hard, we must try to remember the good things. Notice how Zagajewski starts by asking us to try to praise the mutilated world. And then he demands, you must praise the mutilated world. And then in a parental tone, he says, you should praise the mutilated world. Until finally, he simply pleads with us to praise the mutilated world. It's almost as if he's trying to figure out how to do this hard thing of praising amidst all the devastation. Filled as the world is with refugees, war, disasters, and terror, we nonetheless must try to remember June's long days, wild strawberries, rosé wine, the fluttering curtains, the moments we were together, the music, the light. 
We must praise the mutilated world because praising is itself a hard thing to do. The poem doesn't say how to do it, but somehow we must find a way to do it. And finally, importantly, the poem ends hopefully recalling the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. No, the poem doesn't tell us how to do it, and you may be sure that I can't tell you how to do it. But for darn sure, we won't learn how to do it if all we do is listen to the analysts and the pundits and the chatterati and the talking heads on CNN, or dare I say, Twitter. <laughs> Turn it all off for a while. I say that now is the time to spend more time with art and music and poetry and nature and one another, for these are what truly have therapeutic power. Consider this magnificent AIDS quilt that arose from one of the deadliest of epidemics. This quilt praises the mutilated world. Each panel represents a life lost, but also a life loved, even after premature death. The entire quilt, you know, is considered the largest piece of community folk art in the world and memorializes 94,000 people. It is estimated in its entirety to weigh 54 tons. And we must remember it was conceived at a time when the AIDS stigma was so great that public acknowledgement often was impossible and even funeral homes and cemeteries refused their services so that the quilt became the only way for families and loved ones to remember those they loved. The quilt praises the mutilated world. It is an act of homespun defiance, a plea to mourn, and remember what has been lost, and it is also a call to resist hopelessness. Now, back for a moment to acceptance. Yes, I accept the election of Donald J. Trump as our next president. This is a bit reminiscent of a famous anecdote about Margaret Fuller, who once dramatically proclaimed, I accept the universe, <laughs> to which the philosopher Thomas Carlyle sardonically replied, ye gads, she'd better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I accept the election because that is the mutilated reality. Under no circumstances, however, do I accept racism, misogyny, Islamophobia, hate speech, xenophobia, fear-mongering, lying, bullying, anti-intellectualism, mean-spirited, bloviating vulgarity and stupidity, oligarchy, patriarchy, and plutocracy. Don't get me started. <laughs> I and we will resist these blasphemies with every fiber of our being. And this is not about Trump. This is about behaviors that blaspheme all that is compassionate, humane, and holy in this world. Look at the quote at the top of your order of service from Barry Lopez's novel, Resistance. He says, 
The trick, I suppose, is to contradict those who say vigilance is not necessary. No, we must be vigilant. We must not normalize this moment in history while at the same time being careful not to declare any particular person or thing the enemy. That religion, this or that political party, a certain constituency, capitalism, this or that head of state. Rather, it is for us to dismantle the stage upon which any Trump or any tyrant, any self-anointed claimant to power performs. It is for us to direct the attention of his audience to a place where that tyrant has no authority, no influence. Resistance is something we need to get good at. I think I first started to think about resistance last year as our climate justice activism was heating up. We were putting up that Black Lives Matter banner. A bunch of us were getting arrested and going to court, being feisty and living up to our bumper sticker of not being a well-behaved church. Yes, let Megan be in our prayers today, for she and hundreds of other clergy responded to the Lakota people's call to join the water protectors at Standing Rock for a day of resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline. She texted me this morning with a photo of snow-covered hills and said she was going to a chaplaincy training and an interfaith day of prayer followed by direct action. I assured her that our bail fund was ready. <laughs> I too did a bit of resistance last week by joining Boston fast food workers in their fight for a living wage. They had a one day strike on Wednesday and on Thursday with many other clergy. I accompanied workers returning to Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's and I introduced myself to their managers and asked for their assurance that there would be no recriminations after their employees had exercised their federally protected right to strike. There are lots of opportunities to resist and there likely will be many more to come. And so many months ago I got a copy of this book by the Old Testament scholar and theologian Walter Brueggemann. I haven't read much of Brueggemann but I've heard him speak a few times, and he is an old, craggy, bearded, intense, grumpy, Old Testament-like prophet. He's rock-solidly biblical, but he's also radical. And when I saw that this book is titled Sabbath as Resistance Saying No to the Culture of Now, I bought a used copy and I never got around to reading that until last week. Good timing. So this little book is about resistance, but it's not all about demonstrations and protests and rabble-rousing, though those things can be all well and good and necessary. Rather, it is about the frame of heart and mind we bring to our present circumstances. Like the moral of the Fowler's story I told the kids, we not, may not always be able to alter the net in which we're caught, but maybe we can change something about ourselves that will free us from that net. So this is a book about Sabbath as resistance. It's a book about the importance of keeping the Sabbath. But it's not about going to church. It's not moralistic. It's not about rules and whether a person should be able to play cards or buy liquor on Sunday. Brueggemann says instead that the celebration of Sabbath is an act of both resistance and alternative. 
It is resistance because it is a visible insistence that our lives are not defined by the production and consumption of commodity goods. It is also an alternative to the demanding, chattering, pervasive presence of trumped up advertising and its great liturgical claim of professional sports that devour all our rest time. The alternative on offer, Brueggemann says, the alternative on offer is the awareness and practice of the claim that we are situated on the receiving end of the gifts of God. Now, translate that if you need to. But he is saying that for our own good, for the well-being of our very souls, we must make time to praise the mutilated world. Brueggemann calls on us to resist anxiety and embrace calm. Resist coercion and embrace freedom. Resist exclusivism and embrace inclusion. Resist multitasking, which gives our full attention to nothing, and instead embrace this one moment now. Brueggemann, again, is an Old Testament scholar, and he makes a prophetic critique of ancient Israel, which had forgotten their liberating God of the Exodus and instead became seduced and captive to land and power and commodity. The lead representative of turning away from the Sabbath and turning toward commodity was Solomon. Stick with me here, people, because this is, this is going to get good. <laughs> Solomon's grandiose temple, described in the Book of Kings, was designed solely to impress. And this was worth taking down our 1817 Fitch Bible so you can hear it straight from it. Sixth chapter of Kings. And the oracle in the forepart was 20 cubits in length and 20 cubits in breadth and 20 cubits in the height thereof, and he overlaid it with pure gold and so covered the altar, which was of cedar. So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold. And he made a partition by the chains of gold before the oracle. And he overlaid it with gold. And the whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the house. Also the whole altar that was by the oracle he overlaid with gold. And Solomon made all the vessels that pertained unto the house of the Lord the altar of gold. And the table of gold, whereupon the showbread was, and the candlesticks of pure gold, five on the right side, five on the left, before the oracle with the flowers and the lamps and the tongs of gold, and the bowls, and the snuffers, and the basins, and the spoons, and the censers of pure gold, and the hinges of gold, both for the doors of the inner house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the house, to wit, of the temple. Gold! Gold! What is this? Trump Tower! <laughs> Holy Goldman Sachs! <laughs> now this is back to Brueggemann talking. Beyond the temple, Solomon was the big-time entrepreneur who managed to amass every kind of commodity available. 
and like all such celebrity accumulators, others were eager to contribute to Solomon's collection. Every one of them brought up present objects of silver and gold garments, weaponry, spices, horses, and mules, so much year by year. This gets even better. In addition to temple gold and exotic possessions, Solomon's accumulation of women points to the conclusion that even women, wives, and concubines had become commodities for the king, either trophy mates or instruments of policy. This acquisitiveness testifies to a kind of restlessness on Solomon's part. It is easiest to imagine that Solomon never ceased to plan and scheme and negotiate and usurp in his drive to accumulate. Such, such restlessness in the service of acquisitiveness surely meant no Sabbath for him. We may judge, moreover, that Solomon is a representative embodiment of commodity restlessness that pervaded Israel in its disregard of all things covenantal. What is being contrasted here is the Ark of the Covenant with the art of the deal. You can worship God, or you can worship man. You cannot worship both. Covenant or commodity. We've got to decide which will it be. Ours is a covenantal faith. Not dependent on any supernatural authority, we covenant with one another. We make promises to one another that love shall be the spirit of this church. That we will value the worth and dignity of every human being. That we will praise the life we share in common with all life. Not me first, not America first, but we will try to praise the whole of this mutilated world and its pieces, the wild strawberries, the wine, the music, the leaves that scover the scarred earth, the uh, acorns, the moments we are together, the light. To live in covenant is to reject covetousness which is the pursuit of commodity at the expense of neighbor. To live in covenant is to reject idolatry, which is the worship of some lesser thing at the expense of the whole. Brueggemann ends his little book with an examination of the 73rd Psalm. Go home and take a look at it. He calls the 73rd Psalm a journey from the world of commodity to the world of communion and covenant. And first, the psalmist describes the wicked. They are prosperous, verse 3. Not in trouble, verse 5. Proud. Verse 6, well-fed and well-entertained, frog's legs. Verse 7, <laughs> cynical and socially indifferent. Verse 7, treated like celebrities. <clears throat> Verse 10, defiant before and dismissive of God. Verse 11, and rich and at ease. Verse 12. Now, the psalmist actually think all these things sound pretty good, attractive, and very, very tempting. But then later, almost too late, the psalmist realizes that such a life has no staying power. The psalmist realizes that so much in our commodity culture 
promotes phony, worthless, wasteful, selfish stuff. Instead, we must praise only that which is praiseworthy, even when mutilated. Brueggemann pauses at the 73rd Psalm, verse 23, which says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. And Brueggemann ends his book telling this story. I recently heard a Lutheran pastor describe a woman who had walked 700 miles as a refugee to escape a violent war and was finally able to cross a national boundary out of the war zone. She walked all that way and brought with her an eight-year-old girl who walks beside her. For 700 miles, the child held her hand tightly. When they reached the safety, the girl loosened her grip and the woman looked at her hand. It was raw and bloody with an open wound because the little girl held on tightly in her fearfulness. As in verse 23, nevertheless I am continually with you, you hold my right hand. And Brueggemann concludes, this is no casual hand holding. This is a life or death grip that does not let go. No Sabbath existence imagines getting through on our own, surrounded by commodities to accumulate and before which to bow down. But a commodity cannot hold one's hand. Only late does the psalmist come to know otherwise. Only late may we also come to know, but likely not without Sabbath rest. We, with our hurts, fears, and exhaustion, are left restless until then. This is a call to resist, and we will resist in many ways. This is also a call to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Sabbath is an occasion to resist the temptations of the wicked, to rest, and to praise the mutilated world. Clench and unclench your fist. Hold one another's hands. Hold one another's hands. Be not anxious or afraid. You will love and be loved, hurt and be hurt, and you will know despair and taste regret, but you will accept all this and ask for more. And look to the gentle light that strays and vanishes. and returns. May it be so.